Well, good morning, church. What a day to be in the house of the Lord. Turn to your name. Yeah, well, yeah, we can. Yeah, what a, let's go. I want you to turn to your neighbor really quick and just tell him I'm so glad you're here this morning. Good to see everyone. We're you guys are excited to see each other. We're gonna have coffee after church, guys. All right, all right. Relax a little bit. I love the joy. I love the joy. Well, how about last week? I want to just give a shout out to Pastor Matt and Sarah for coming and being our guest ministers. Can we just give them a hand? We hope you guys were blessed and encouraged by their ministry last week. Julie and I spent the week down south in Mexico with family, and we are sun-kissed, okay? We, we are a little bit tanner for sure. Well, this week, we're kicking off a new series. We're going to be walking through the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthews chapter 5, 6, and 7, we've titled this series, Thy Kingdom Come. Thy Kingdom Come. Jesus prays the famous Lord's Prayer in these chapters where he says, we pray. Does anybody know it? Our Father, right? Who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Stop there. All right. So that was uh, a famous prayer that Jesus teaches us how to pray. Thy kingdom come is part of the emphasis of his words, of his teaching, that we invite the kingdom here. So I'm excited to walk through this together with you guys. Are you excited? All right. I've got a lot of ground to cover today, so we're going to get to it. Okay. We've got some ground to cover. So I want us to get to it. If you would, go with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1. If you brought your Bibles, you can turn there. If you've got your phones, you can go there. Uh, I read and teach out of the ESV, the English Standard Version. We will read a few verses, and then we're going to jump in, and we're going to dive in and break this down together. Super excited that you guys are here with us this morning. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 1, Jesus says this, seeing the crowds, or Matthew writes this, seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountainside, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied or filled Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. We'll stop there. Would you join me in prayer and we'll get going. Heavenly Father, we love you so much. God, we thank you for this day. This is the day that you have made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, we ask that you would, uh, Lord, just give us a, a unified heart today. As we, as the body of Christ, as the church, study your word together. God, and may the things that we say in the meditations of our heart and our thoughts, Lord, be glorifying and pleasing to you. We love you so much. We thank you for who you are. It's in your name I pray. And everyone said, amen. 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 I want to start by asking you a question. How many of you like puzzles? You like to do puzzles? Anybody? Any puzzle people in the house? It's okay. It's all right. Puzzles, puzzles are something. They're, they're interesting. I, I am not, okay? I'm, I'm going to tell you, I am not. I want it to be known. I want it to be on the record. Sam is not a puzzle person, okay? I am not. Puzzles repel me, okay? Like, I see a puzzle, and I dash the other direction. I'm gone. Just the box with the picture on it, you open it, and there's all these pieces in there, and I'm just like, oh, gross. Like, get that away from me. I don't, 
I don't like it. Now, my wife, on the other hand, Julie, she is a puzzle person, okay? She should be right now inducted into the Puzzle Hall of Fame, okay? Like, she just gets it. She does it. She loves it. She, the box, the pieces, everything. She's got her own puzzle board with drawers with all the pieces. It's, it's wild. It's bizarre. She loves it, okay? And she's great at it, and I, I am not. Okay, like 500-piece set, 300-piece set, all the shapes and the curvatures and everything just right fitting into one glorious masterpiece, one portrait. I just, I can't do it. I just can't do it. The truth about puzzles is that each puzzle piece plays a significant role and part in the bigger picture. Every piece, shape, design, all must be precise, right? Precise and extremely detailed in their making of the picture as a whole. Okay, here we go. You ready for this? Yes, I used a puzzle illustration to jump into the scripture this morning. Okay, Matthews 5, 6, and 7 must always be taken within the context of Matthew's gospel as a whole. Okay, so I want to give you just a little bit of context here. Stay with me before we kind of get into it. Okay, Matthew's gospel is written primarily with a Jewish audience in mind, okay? So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, they all had specific audiences and specific people that they were writing to. Matthew's audience is predominantly Jewish. He is speaking to the Jewish believers or the Jews in his time who were wanting to follow Jesus. He's writing to them with a specific purpose in mind. And the whole goal for his list his listeners, is to bring them to a clear understanding that this, Jesus is the Messiah because of his complete fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, okay? He is, in fact, the Messiah, the Son of God. He is it. He is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. Matthew's writing is a giant puzzle that is aiding his audience about Jesus, the Messiah, who completed and fulfilled every prophecy confirming his Messiahship through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Okay, so according to uh, biblical scholars and theologians, Jesus fulfilled over 300 Old Testament prophecies. All of them. Dotted every I. Crossed every T. Now, Perfectly, right, precisely, each prophecy, every detail and shape completed in the work of Jesus. Now, let's not also forget the 600-plus laws that Jesus held to a team. 300 prophecies, 600 laws. Wow. It's pretty incredible what he did. See, ancient Israel could not complete the law. Abraham could not complete and perfect the law. David could not complete and perfect the law. Moses could not complete and perfect the law. So God, in his sovereignty, was speaking through all of the Old Testament prophecies, and they were declaring of the one to come who would complete and fulfill every single law, every single prophecy, completely setting the people free. Let me give you one of those prophecies. It's found in Isaiah 61. If you're writing notes, take this down. Isaiah 61, starting in verse 1. I'm going to read just three scriptures. Isaiah 61, the prophet Isaiah prophesied this, okay, years before the birth of Christ. Here's what he says. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. To the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and opening and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Does that not sound a lot like Matthew chapter 5? Sounds very similar. So one day Jesus uh, uh, is, is going to the synagogue for church, and he, and he pulls for church, and he, and he pulls up, he rolls up to the synagogue, as was his custom, and the leaders hand him the scroll of Isaiah, 
with this passage to read from. And in Luke chapter 4, verse 17, Luke says this, And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, Jesus. And in verse 21, here's what it says. And he, he being Jesus, began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So we must understand this as we approach the Sermon on the Mount. We've got to have that parameter. We've got to have all those edges of the puzzle piece, right, built out before we get into the meat and bones of it. Jesus has completed the puzzle. He's fulfilled the law. No more customs, no more traditions, no more self-righteousness, no more works-based theology. He completed everything. We must have proper orthodoxy, right? Right belief about who God is and about what Christ has done for us before we can get us into proper orthopraxy, which is right living, the way that we live out our faith. And biblical orthodoxy reminds us that all of the scriptures point to Jesus. All of the scriptures All of the prophets proclaim Jesus the Messiah. All of creation declares the glory of God in Christ Jesus alone. Salvation, liberation, freedom, true righteousness is found in Christ alone. Salvation, freedom, true righteousness, the gift of salvation is found in Christ alone. Amen. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, And he went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming this gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So this is what's happening as we get into the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is, Jesus is getting super famous. He's becoming just a really big deal. Town to town, crowds are hearing about him. They're following him. I mean, the Jesus tour is about to take off. You know, he's, he's going, he's doing his thing, and people are going after him. And he's proclaiming the gospel of what? The kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom. There's different titles of the gospel in scripture. There's the gospel of God, which is kind of also translated the good news about God. There's the gospel of grace. There's the gospel of peace. And there's the gospel of the kingdom, the good news about the kingdom of God. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, is an invitation to God's kingdom an invitation to the kingdom culture. Isn't that cool? Kingdom culture, kingdom living, the way we do things here, the way we live here. What kind of culture do you want to create? What kind of culture do you want to live in? What kind of culture do you want in your home? What kind of culture do you want for your children? What kind of culture do we want for our church? My answer would be kingdom culture. I want the kingdom culture in every environment that I'm in. It's an invitation here to a different way of living, a different worldview, and a different way of life. According to Jesus, it's simply better. This is better. It's a better way. It's a better way to live. It's a better way to operate. It's a better perspective and worldview on life. It exceeds living by the standards of the law, and it exceeds living by the standards of the world. It assures blessing and an unbreakable foundation for your life, as we'll see in Matthew chapter 7. Unbreakable, a firm foundation for your life. So here we go. Verses 1 and 2. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, don't miss the portrait Here you have the fulfillment of the law. Jesus is modeling the exact process of the original law, the Mosaic law. Remember, that was given to Moses. Remember, Moses goes up on Mount Sinai, right? He goes up the mountain, and God begins to download on his tablet the Ten Commandments, right? He gets gets it right there, all the Ten Commandments, downloads it to them. But here, Jesus goes up the mountain. He sits down with his Disciples and crowds were following after him, and he begins to download on their minds and on their hearts the gospel of the kingdom. 
It's the new covenant, the new way of relating to God, relationship with God. I love the, the beauty of the scene. If you can just imagine it in your mind, it's, it's not one person alone with God on top of a mountain, secluded and isolated. No, it's, it's no more like that. Rather, it's, it's God incarnate in the midst of his disciples and followers and people who were wanting to get to know them. There were, there were mothers there. There were fathers listening to him. There were children listening to him. There was young men, young women who were all there in the midst along with the disciples hearing him, hearing him teach. And he opened his mouth and taught them saying, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my, on my account. Rejoice and be glad. For your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Number one, here's what I want you to know. You can write this down if you're taking notes. God's kingdom begins with God's blessing. God's kingdom culture begins with God's blessing. The greatest sermon ever preached, ever. No other pastor, no other preacher, no other teacher has ever taught a better sermon than this sermon right here. This is it. This is the cream of the crop. This is, this is the best sermon, the greatest sermon ever preached. Begins with nine blessings. One a day, three on Sunday. Nine blessings. And it's, it's as if Jesus is saying, follow me and you will have a, a blessed life because my gift of salvation requires my blessing. It begins with God's blessing. If God has saved you, if God has redeemed you, if God has restored you, if God has healed you, if God has changed your heart, if God has changed your mind or your thoughts or your way of thinking, if he has done anything, if he has comforted you, then he has blessed you. Grace, faith, and purpose, and love, and truth, all of those flow from God's blessings. You know how my kids know that I love them? Not because I give them five bucks. Not because I buy them ice cream every now and then. Not because they have a million toys in their room. It's not how they know that I love them. My my kids know that I love them because I bless them. I bless them at night. I bless them before school. I bless them before bedtime. I I, I speak blessing over my kids, and they know that I, love the, that I love them. I remind them of who they are and whose they are. They are my son. They're my daughter. They belong to me. Ultimately, they belong to God, but God has entrusted their lives to me. My blessing as their father, prayerfully, will ultimately remind them of the blessing of their heavenly father. But let me tell you something, guys just because I bless them every day. Okay, I can bless them, bless them for 4,800 times a day. It does not make them little angels. You feel me? They're little knuckleheads still. They act up. They drive mom and dad crazy. But I don't remove my blessing on them based on their works or their actions. I don't I don't retract it. I don't take my blessing away because of the things that they, they do. I lovingly guide them towards correction and truth. And the Beatitudes are not a checklist for us to just check off and see how we're doing, see if we're measuring up. It's not just a list of, of rules, to-dos, to know if you're a Christian or not. They are continuous blessings and guides that remind us of who we are in Christ. The Beatitudes remind us that we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer who we used to be. We are now sons and daughters of God. It's going, oh, 
I, I, I follow Jesus, so I no longer conduct myself with arrogance and pride. I realize that I am poor in spirit, and apart from Christ, I am nothing. Oh, I'm reminded of that. Oh, I no longer have to deal with the pain in this life alone because my mourning will be greeted and comforted through the Holy Spirit, who is the great comforter. He is with me through my pain. He is with me through my suffering, through my hardships, and I no longer have to walk through this alone. Oh, because of his goodness and his grace, I no longer desire the things of the world because I hunger and I thirst for righteousness. And this thirst for righteousness, this is the, this is the righteousness that truly fulfills and satisfies my soul. I don't need these other things because I'm fulfilled and satisfied by his righteousness. They remind us of who we are in Christ. God's kingdom culture begins with God's blessing. And the section ends here where Matthew writes and and records Jesus saying, you are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Number two, if you're taking notes, write this down. God's kingdom makes us salty. God's kingdom makes us salty. Turn to your neighbor and just tell him, be salty. Be salty. Turn to your other neighbor and tell him, live salty. Live salty. What is salt? It's a preserver, right? Salt preserves Salt gives flavor, salt adds, salt is good. Some of us love it, right? It's a preserver. It gives those bland mashed potatoes some flavor, for goodness. Pass the salt. Every time somebody says pass the salt, I'm like, oh, it doesn't taste that good. It preserves what is good so it can stay good. This is the best part about following Jesus. It's the best part about being a believer. Our lives become lights and salt that gives the world flavor and goodness. And that's who we are. And that's what we get to do with the people that we're around, with our family, with our friends, our coworkers, neighbors. We get to add flavor and goodness to their lives. This is the journey and the adventure that we get invited to by being a part of God's kingdom. The great invitation. This is the joy, fun, and purposeful life that we get to live by trusting in the one who truly satisfies and fulfills. Amen. This is this is the life. It's the best life. Psalm 34, 8, and I'm ending and concluding right here. Psalm 34, in verse 8, the psalmist says this, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is bland. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is uh, missing something. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is salty. That the Lord is is good. And then he goes on to say this word. Look, just after that, what does it say? Blessed. Blessed. Blessed is the man or woman who takes refuge in him. One translation says it like this. Blessed is the one who runs to Christ. Blessed is the one who runs to him. Here's my encouragement for for you today. Be blessed today. Be blessed today. 
Know that you have a heavenly Father who is looking down upon you, who is with you, who dwells in you, who will never leave you, who will never forsake you, who is always beside you. And as a son or a daughter of the great and mighty king, he is speaking blessing over you. He's blessing you because you are his son and daughter. Be blessed today and be salty. Be salty. All for the glory of the king of the kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Jesus, we love you so much. God, we thank you for your word. It is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, I thank you for, Lord, just this, this message, this teaching that you, that you chose to give. God, not only to your disciples, not only to those who were there, God, but to all of humanity, God, to your sons and to your daughters, what it's like to live, to be a part of the kingdom of God. God, the adventure, the joy, Lord, the purpose that you give to us. We're not here just to make some money and to live a nice life. Or, God, we're here because you created us and designed us with a purpose, on purpose, for a purpose. And God, I pray that you would continue to reveal that purpose to us each and every day. God, whether we're 10 or, Lord, whether we're 60, 70, 80, God, we still have a purpose here on this earth. We are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world, not because of who we are, but because of who you are in us. I pray for my friends, my brothers, my sisters here this morning. God, wherever they are in their walk with you, Lord, I pray that they would trust you today. I pray that they would place their faith and trust in you wholeheartedly, knowing that you hold their life in your hands. And God, that you are inviting us into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of God. Lord, on earth as it is in heaven, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We love you so much, Jesus. We bless you today. We thank you for who you are and the blessing that you give to us. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen.